Today I'm going to be talking about the cosmological argument for the existence of God. This argument takes its name from the Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. So essentially this argument is attempting to prove God's existence by claiming that he is the originator or cause of the world. And if we see that the world has a cause, then that cause would be God. We would say that this is an a posteriori argument. That means that it's trying to draw on our experiences of the world around us, our experiences of things having causes or beginning, being set in motion, and using those experiences to argue for God. We would also say that it is an inductive argument. That means it's trying to give us a probable explanation for the premises. So the conclusion, if the premises are true, the conclusion is very likely to be true. But it can't give us complete logical certainty, like a mathematical argument or something like that. So it's a posteriori, and it's inductive. Today I just want to briefly talk through a few major forms of the argument and offer a few quick comments. Well, the argument was first put forward by the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. Essentially, he argued that the world must have some kind of cause of explanation, and he put this down to a god-like explanation. But probably the most famous classic defender of the argument was the Catholic theologian philosopher of the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas. And we've encountered him before, and we'll do so again. Now Aquinas has his famous arguments, the five ways of proving God in his work Summa Theologica. And he's bringing together a lot of what he sees as the most basic and simple arguments which just illuminate the concept of God. So perhaps the five ways shouldn't be seen as a definitive proof from Aquinas, but he's certainly, certainly trying to show the rationality of belief in God. So we've got five arguments, and the first three of these arguments are what we might call cosmological arguments. They go a bit like this. First up, there's the argument from motion. Aquinas says, look at the world around you. Things move, and they move because something caused them to move. So I could roll a ball across a table, or I could drop an object, but things set in motion have something motivating them. Now Aquinas says you can go back and back and look at different objects being set in motion by previous objects or previous agents, but you can't take that chain back infinitely. Okay, something set one object in motion, another one before, another one before, but that chain can't be infinite, and for all sorts of complex reasons which we won't enter into today. Aquinas firmly believed you couldn't have an infinite series of things causing motion. So he says there must be something which started it all off, which caused movement in the first place. And he called this an unmoved mover. Something which itself isn't moved by anything else, but which sets the universe in motion and in its way. And this Aquinas said was God. Aquinas' second way is an argument from causation. He starts off with a very simple premise. Everything which exists is some cause of its existence. And there is some, as technical term is, efficient cause. Something which brings it about and says why it's there. Okay, so I was brought into being by my parents and they by their parents and etc, etc. Just like with the first argument, Aquinas here says... Well, we can't have that infinite chain of causes going back okay, without, without end. There must be, he says, some end point to that. There must be, he says, an uncaused cause. Something which was the first cause of the universe, but which itself was not caused by anything else. And this being, he says, is God. Lastly, Aquinas offers a cosmological argument based on contingency. This word contingency in philosophy refers to anything which depends on something else for its existence, and might conceivably not exist. 
okay, so I'm contingent, one day I won't exist, and I depend on all sorts of things for my existence, food, water, sleep, etc. The list is very long. Now, Aquinas says, if you look at the universe, all the things alive and existing within the universe are contingent. They come and they go, they depend on other stuff for their existence. But, we have to think back and think, what could cause this universe of contingent objects? The universe itself must be contingent. All the things within it are contingent. So, he says, there must be one thing which lies behind all the contingent things, which does not depend on anything else for its existence, and it is a necessary being. This is God. Okay, so God doesn't rely on anything else for his existence and works as an explanation for why there's a universe full of contingent things. Everything else is dependent. God relies on nothing but himself. And there you have it. Three arguments from Aquinas are classic cosmological arguments. And I want to look at a slightly different argument from the later philosopher Leibniz. Here we're talking about the principle of sufficient reason. This is one of Leibniz's philosophical arguments. And it's a broader argument in the first place. It isn't just to do with God. And it essentially says this. Leibniz says, There is no thing which exists or which happens which doesn't have some sort of reasonable explanation for it. There must be some sufficient reason to explain it. Okay, why do I exist? Well, there's a reason for that. My parents conceived me. I eat food, I sleep, etc. There are reasons we can give for that. Why does my desk exist? Well, some carpenter made it out of wood. Um, why does anything happen? Any event, Leibniz would say, has to have some reasonable explanation. In other words, it's just giving us this very simple principle. Stuff doesn't just happen for no reason. It doesn't just pop into being. Things have reasons. Now... Leibniz then says, well, what about the universe? The universe is a whole series of objects which have reasons for their existence. The universe, too, must have some sufficient reason for its existence. There must be a good explanation for why it's here. That explanation can't come from within the universe itself, because nothing can be a sufficient reason to explain its own being there. There must be something outside the universe, which gives a sufficient reason for its existence. This, he says, is God. And if you think about it, what Leibniz is saying is a bit like what Aquinas is saying. The universe is full of stuff that needs to be explained. We'll posit something outside of that universe to explain it. We'll say that that is God. That was a very brief explanation, but I want to cover a lot of ground here. Let's move on to one final version of the argument. The Kalam argument. The Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God is um, an argument which originated in Islamic philosophy, and hence the Arabic term Kalam, which means something like words or, or discussion. This originated with famous Islamic philosophers Al Kindi and Al Ghazali. And essentially what they argued, it's a related point to what Aquinas went on to argue, etc. as well, was that the universe requires some explanation. The universe is not infinite in time. Okay, They didn't believe that it could have existed forever and would exist forever. So there must be some beginning point. This beginning point has something causing it to begin, and that thing is God. Now, they're approaching it, essentially, from a philosophical argument that you can't have actual infinite things. And there are all sorts of interesting arguments why you'd want to reject infinities. Infinities create all sorts of problematic, funny little contradiction puzzles. But the argument's been taken up much more recently by the modern philosopher and theologian, evangelical scholar, William Lane Craig. 
Now, he's turning it into a Christian argument as a way of defending and supporting his Christian belief in God. Craig doesn't change too much from the original Islamic philosophy version, but he just provides some slightly different explanations. He agrees with the arguments that you can't have actual infinite things or infinite series, so the universe must have a beginning. But on top of those classic Islamic arguments, he appeals to modern day cosmology and science. And he'll look at a theory such as the Big Bang and say, the Big Bang shows that the universe had a beginning. It didn't exist, and then it did exist. So there's a different type of evidence for premise one. So, Craig is essentially arguing something which begins to exist has, has a cause, something brought it into existence. The universe had a beginning, so the universe has some cause that brought it into existence, and that must be God. So he's able to combine some of Monday science with the classic philosophical arguments. Finally, I'm just going to offer a few quick comments on some of these classic forms. Well, the cosmological argument I think is a really interesting argument, and I've not really done it justice here. This is a really a whistle-stop tour, just to give you a flavour of some of the key forms of the argument. The universe, this argument claims, has a beginning, or at least has some need of cause. It has, requires an explanation. And I suppose that point is where the contention really lies. Does the universe need something outside of itself to explain it, to have brought it into being? Or can we argue, to the contrary, that maybe the universe could be self-sufficient? It brought itself into being, or in some different way it's always existed. Now this is tricky stuff because it catapults you into some of the debate about the origins of the universe, and that's not really settled yet. Can we say that the universe began or you might argue for a different theory, such as a steady state theory, that there's always been some kind of universes. Or another th theory, that universes come and go, and one universe is, begins and collapses, and another one begins. So it's very difficult to find a definitive answer to that question. But I would say the Big Bang is a widely accepted theory, so you might say that the universe has some sort of beginning or cause, but, and I think this is probably the more telling criticism, I don't see how that observation that the universe has a beginning or cause necessarily leads you very clearly, I think, to a personal creator God. I mean, let's say the argument shows that the, the universe needs some explanation or cause. How do you move from that point to the conclusion that that cause is God? Surely we only have to posit some being or process or object sufficient to cause the universe. So is it personal? Is it loving? Is it powerful? Is it wise? Is it familiar to us from our understanding of God? I'm not sure about that. But I think the cosmological argument, though it doesn't prove God, lends some interesting reflections and meditations to the theist. And I suppose if you combine it with other arguments, you may think that you can build some sort of case for God. But it's very controversial, and I would encourage you to look into it much more deeply than this brief discussion allows.